Hey, welcome uh, to Spear Factor. Today's guest is the world record holding, um, just even besides that, uh, just a badass diver, Tracy Whitmire. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, let's get started with, before we get into your personal, you know, uh, your personal story as far as getting involved in spearfish and all that, I just really want to jump to tell us the story about the pending world record um, bluefin, because if anybody that's been here uh, in San Diego, we, we know where the big boys are, and I just don't have the bank account right now to go 120 miles from here at the time and go chase yeah. these guys. So can you give us like the play-by-play -play on how you – about this, the story about the fish? Yeah, sure. So we had decided to go out and – um just, it was supposed to be a epic weather day. So my husband is a charter captain and he went out the day prior and they saw a fish at 55 miles. So we thought it would be a great idea to go out because that didn't sound that far for the big boys. And then we ended up getting there and they weren't there. And then we kept going and then we kept, kept going and we started to see a little fish puddle around, nothing too big. And we were running into some boats, probably about 80 miles away. And at this point we're thinking, man, we're real far away. And, and then we stumbled upon a, a bunch of foaming fish and it was really neat. I love going out and seeing all those fish um, foam around. And it was really National Geographic that day. We were seeing whales circled by football fields of fish. And it was crazy, but it was just so hard to get on them because they were very boat shy. And when we did get to see them in the water, I was diving along with one of our friends, Derek Rush, and we would see one or two fish at a time. And we're, we're just like, where are all the fish? We see a, a football field of fish and we dive down and we see one or two. And that was pretty much the theme of the day. And finally we kept driving and we got Derek on a fish. It was great. He shot his personal best that day. He got a 170 pounder. And so then I shot about a 50 pounder and we were 106 miles away from where we launched. And we're just like, we got to go home. We got to go home. It's getting late. I have work tomorrow. We got to clean up this fish. And I thought I'd stay in my suit until the fat lady sung. <laughs> and about five, 10 miles on the way back home, my husband, Maddie, spots a breezer and we hadn't seen breezers all day long. They were all foaming, they were all moving fast. And we get on this breezer and of course they're boat shy, so they wouldn't let us get in front of it. And so I had to slide off the boat and I just started kicking towards them. And I thought they were moving away from me, but they ended up moving away and then they came back towards me and all of a sudden I hear my husband yell dive. And so I dove down and the viz is pretty terrible that day. And I get down there, honestly, not too deep. I started seeing the fish about 30 feet and I leveled off. I saw a couple and they were moving much slower than the ones earlier that day. And I was tracking one and I almost clicked off a shot. And then I, out of the corner of my eye, I saw another one that was just, it seemed like it was dead stopped in the water, like just much bigger than the other ones around it. It was really frightening, honestly, how big it was compared to the rest of them. And I just turned my gun and I shot that thing. And I was like, all right, there is the one. It was, you know, easy shot relatively. And you know, it, it went down, 
didn't take the float down and I surfaced and the float just kind of didn't even move. It seemed like the fish like almost fell off at one point because the float just fell over. And so I get to the float and I'm like, oh gosh, it probably ripped off. And I started pulling it up and I thought, yeah, it's still here. And I pulled it up to about 30 feet of bungee plus the shooting line left. And that fish just lit up like hell. And it was stalemate. I could, I was holding on with all my deer strength and, um, you know, it just, it took about 20 minutes for it to kind of settle down a little bit. And I got, finally got to the shooting line and I go to the boat, grab my other gun, loaded it. I go down and I shoot it in the gills. I'm like, all right, got this thing and pull up the fish. And I'm like, holy cow, this thing's huge. It was just, you know, I knew it was my biggest one and I just didn't realize it was so big just because I didn't really think it fought as hard as a big one should fight. And, um, so I pull it up and I brain them and I'm just holding this fish next to me and I'm just like, geez, this thing is, is just a cow. I, I just, I had in my mind, I'm like, oh my gosh, this thing is huge. It's taller than me for sure. And um, very, very heavy being dead weight in the water. I, could, I couldn't even barely swim with it. <laughs> so got it to the boat, had, had Derek hop in the water with his underwater camera and be able to take some awesome shots of the fish of me, with me in the water and everything. And um, got him on the gaff and pulled him in, and there it is. Wait, okay, so when you say he lit up, now you, I imagine you were. Did you have it? Were you using a clinch, or were yes? You, okay, so he had tension yes. when he lit up and took off. He he lit up, and I was able to hold the the clinch right there but I could not get him any closer to me. And I didn't, I really didn't want to let him go back down because when you let him just pull around down there, that's, that's a recipe for tearing off and, you know, sharks coming and all not, not a good thing. And then you have to work again to hold him back up there. So I had in my mind, I had to keep him up there. No, oh, right. I've, I've seen that before where it's like, it took you an hour to get to this point. And yeah. you'll be damned if you're going to let this thing <laughs> risk it all again. But so um, it's funny because you're describing, you know, going a hundred miles and then they're all boat shy. And I don't think people will truly appreciate that or not really appreciate, but understand the frustration level of bluefin, <laughs> bluefin hunting where, you know, even if you find the fish, if they're smaller, it's like, well, these ones are letting me get in on them. So I might as well right. get in and get some food. But um, when you start talking about looking for those triple digit fish, it's a lot of money, a lot of time and a lot of frustration. And it's weird because it seems like it just comes together some days and there's no rhyme or reason to it. That's right. Bluefin diving. <laughs> it can be the highest of highs and also the lowest of lows. Yeah. What, um, what, yeah. what charter business does Matt, uh, captain for, or. Maddie works for Mad Max sport fishing. He just started last year and he's, um, he usually runs a 32 contender boat yes. and he's, he's out there probably only about twice a week so far, but. Definitely getting in some real great experience with that. Yeah, I think uh, working on the water just adds a whole nother level to your experience and your learning curve. If you can spend as much time as you can, you know, it, it just pays dividends later on in life. Um, so when you one thing that's kind of interesting is when you got the fish in the boat, how did you um, – were you thinking like world record or were you thinking like, okay, we got to get this thing, you know, cool down as best as we can the right way prep. Cause a lot of people are just gill and gut, you know, bleed it out, gill and gut yeah. it. Yeah. What were you thinking? Were you like, uh, this is a, well, 
at the time I was just celebrating in, in my own mind, I honestly, world record wasn't the first thing that came to my mind. It was more of, I just shot a really, really big fish. And I was just <laughs> so proud of that moment because I had been chasing these things for a couple of years. And, you know, I see all these men doing it all the time. And I just, I'm like, I finally got a really, really like nice one, like maybe a cow, like maybe it was a cow. And I didn't know if it was a cow or not, but it, it looked like one to me at the time. So I'm like, I got a cow. Yeah. So, um, so that was really re rewarding for all the work, um, effort we've put into not only this summer, but in summers past where we're just driving around, picking off the little ones and having a great time with the little ones. Anyway, they're real fun to shoot, you know, cause, and also you can shoot a little more of them because they're smaller. And so you can actually eat them all. Right. Um, so, and then just learning along the way, learning the range of your gun, learning how the tuna are behaving because it is different year to year. It seems like, they just get moody some years and then, you know, they're all out at one Tanner bank last year, they were all there. And this year they haven't really quite settled in anywhere. And so I just really appreciate being able to journey through this and, and learn the fish species and, and have a good respect for how hard it is to get on them sometimes. And then on other days, it's just, you know, so much easier for some reason. And yeah, it's just, you know, I love bluefin tuna diving. It's definitely one of the most exhilarating things you can do for sure. Right. I think the, the, the best way to sum up like bluefin tuna for the, I don't know, my friend and I would talk about it where we were heading offshore. You can't sleep the night before because I get super excited and right. we're just, you know, just like, it's just that you never know what's going to swim in front of you. You really don't. And it could be a 20 pound, it could be a 300 pound because it happens. And then you go out, you play whack-a-mole where they jump up and you're trying to find them. And then they get in the water. He's just gone. They just pull the Houdini trick and you've spent, you know, hundreds of dollars in gas and, and you come back and you're on the way back and you're like, and screw bluefin tuna hunting. I hate bluefin. By the time you get yeah. to the dock, you look at each other and you're like, tomorrow? We're going tomorrow? Yep. And you turn <laughs> right back around. We, I yeah. have done that for years. And it's the funniest yeah. thing. Yeah. It's addicting. Yeah. Um, Every time you finish a trip, you're just plotting and scheming the next one. Yep. Yeah. What's uh, What were you using to shoot these fish? I mean, what, what kind of rig did you have? So I, this year I was able to have Captain Bly custom make me a tuna gun and I am so in love with it. It's, I call it my unicorn gun because, um, I had them painted white and it also has a unicorn etched into it. Um, so there's no other gun like mine and I had them specifically make it for me because I'm five, seven and loading a 69 inch gun or a 72 inch gun is just really difficult for me to get in into a position to be able to load that, that tall of a gun. So we decided to make a little bit shorter gun, which is 61 inches and make the bands just super tight. So I could actually reach them and get the gun in front of my chest to be able to load it and have enough penetration power to get those big bluefin. Um, and then, so I had that gun. We have a, a shaft rigged up with a slip tip, 100 foot bungee up to a three atmosphere fear float and the clutch system going on. And so we use that as our primary. And then secondarily, I have, I just use my 52 inch reef gun that I also have, I had him make for me a couple of years ago and also in love with that gun and it has a reel on it, but definitely attaching a float line to it just in case. Um, <laughs> so that bluefin doesn't take that one away if it rips off the first shot. So 
yeah, that's uh, that's my killer setup, and it's it's done well for me this year. I've I find the shorter gun also. I really appreciate the balance between the mass and then being also to be able to track bluefin super easy in the water. Because with the shorter gun, you can swing it around really easily as compared to a larger gun with more mass. But you have to balance that with the kickback. So because it's my gun, I'm super aware and I, I understand what it's going to do. But um, not necessarily if someone else shoots it, I, I just have to say, hey, like, just so you know, it's, it is a shorter gun. I don't even notice it, but my husband says he notices it. So it's just different from those larger big mass guns that don't have any kickback whatsoever. So yours, it, it kicks back. Does it kick up or just kick back like, um, more like a shotgun, like just, you know, I, I couldn't even tell you cause I would say it doesn't really have anything to me, but it did hit my husband in the face when, <laughs> when he shot at one time. So I would guess that it just kicks back. Uh, does he have his teeth and everything? He's good. Yes. He has his teeth. He just was surprised. Yeah. Oh, I think everybody, I think if you spend enough time spearfishing, you'll, you'll get there eventually where you get a butt of a gun right in your mouth and thank God you have a snorkel in or something. Definitely had it before. Yeah. Sure. Um, and, and it's funny cause when it happens, you're like, that was dumb. You know, <laughs> you just know like, well, that was stupid. Um, yeah. how many bands is it, is it, or cause, cause Bly likes to make the rollers. Is it a roller convert? Is it a roller yeah. gun or just straight it's traditional just a straight five band gun? Okay, cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You guys, did you used to work on the lineage charters as well or? No, I, um, I only ever took, I actually took a charter from him when I first started getting into spearfishing. Okay. Um, back in 2019 was my first charter with Bly. Okay. So, um, but no, we, we hadn't worked for him before. Okay. I just noticed some pictures on your Instagram where. Yeah. Um, yeah. we actually got married on that boat. So that maybe would explain it was, that. Well, it was okay. with that. <laughs> very cool. All right. Very cool. And so you said 2019, how, um, how did you even get into all of this? Yeah. So, um, my friend, uh, pilot friend of mine back in the day, he, in 2017, he took me lobster diving one time and I had the best time ever because I was a swimmer and I was in love with the ocean and I just had not believed that I had never experienced it before. And the next year I was actually getting ready to go to Australia for six months because I was doing a exchange program with the Navy. I went to go fly with the Australians for six months to share um, just piloting skills and, and tactical skills. And I really wanted to get into spearfishing. I just didn't know anyone who did it. I didn't, besides the one friend who was in and out of deployment all the time. So I went over to Australia and I show up to the squadron there and it just seemed like everybody spearfished and everyone at work was like, we're going out every Saturday. You want to come? And I just walked into it that way. So I went to their big spearfishing store in Sydney, uh, Adreno, and I just bought everything that you can buy as a newbie spearfisher and just not even knowing what I was getting into and, um, get, get into the water a bunch of times. And honestly, that's just where I fell in love with spearfishing. I fell in love with the reef there and, uh, the reef is, is just gorgeous over there. And, and, you know, reef diving is my favorite diving for sure. Bluefin tuna can get, you know, it's fun and exhilarating, but it's, it's really the reef is where it's at. You see so many cool things and, and so I would go every weekend and then eventually after about a month, I would go two days a week. And then while I was there, I went three days a week, four days a week. I would fit in every dive possible. And it was really cool over there because I had the whole coastline and I would just go explore. I didn't, I didn't know anything or what I was doing. I would just go to a beach and get in the water 
and there is a reef and they had lots of lobster there and um, so many different kinds of fish. I actually bought a, a, a little book with all the fish in it and I had a mission to go and spear as many fish out of that book as I could and cook them all and see which one I liked the best. And so I just, it was like a Pokemon game, gotta catch them all. I just like, I had to do it. And so I, I just, you know, I loved it there. And, and so it came to an end though. I was only there for six months and came back here and I just went out of my way to try to find and meet some people. I went to the dive club. I, I signed up for this charter with Captain Bly and, um, and just figured it out. I bought a kayak and just went to the La Jolla kelp a bunch of times. And I might've done it a bunch too many times by myself, but at that time I, I didn't really feel like I was, I was really pushing hard diving. Like sometimes I'll, I'll push it pretty hard and, and do like the appropriate amounts of up, down, up time and downtime for the water and, and know my limit, but I wasn't doing any, anything near of what I, I would do right now. So I, I was pretty comfortable going by myself. And, and so, yeah, I just, I found the way and, and then I met my husband and he loves spearfishing too. So it's a match made in heaven. Did he spearfish before he met you or were you the catalyst yeah. for that? Yeah. So he, he was spearfishing probably 10, 12 years before me. And I actually met him because when I went on Captain Bly's charter, for some reason we got on the subject of the perfect man for me because I was single and I wasn't really looking for anything. And, and some reason we got on the subject and I just listed out what I wanted in a man and um, Captain Bly and his deckhand looked at each other and said, that's Maddie. And at the time I was like, yeah, whatever. Like it just went over my head and I didn't really believe them for anything because I just didn't believe it. And um, at the end, at the end of that trip, Captain Bly had told me, Hey, maybe one day we'll go diving together on my skiff and um you know, maybe the Coronado Islands trip one day, just keep it in the back of your mind. And so I'm like, okay, yeah, of course I want to go. And so about eight weeks later, he calls me up. He said, you want to go diving on Sunday? I said, hell yeah, I do. And, um, and so when I meet them at the dock, I met Matt and I did not recall at the time, the conversation that I had, I didn't know, like, I didn't know Maddie who they had said was Matt. Matt and so yeah. I go, we go out diving and, um, and apparently I didn't really realize it until two weeks later that it was total setup. And at the end of the day, Matt asked me to dinner and I'm like, okay, I guess I didn't really talk to you all day cause our heads were in the water. So I guess it's time like, that's the appropriate thing to ask if you want to get to know me. And so, um, and then two weeks later, I just dawned on me. I was like, wait a minute, this is the guy, <laughs> this is the guy that they were talking about. So well, go ahead. it was total setup and the rest is history. It worked out. <laughs> so, so captain Bly is like a full service, uh, charter. Yeah, I call it my too. dating service. Yeah. Yeah. Now you're going to have that boat flooded with single people <laughs> trying to make a reality show out of it or something. I don't know. It also does weddings now too. <laughs> yes, that's right. So you got married on the boat as well. Yeah, we got married at the Coronado Islands last year in November. We got my family on board and we had two other boats meet us out there and um, just had a little little party out there and then we went fishing nice so. were you worried about see that the sketchy thing about that is you got married in december you said it was in november oh november you just never know 
yeah, what the weather is going to be like. Yeah, we lucked out. It was dead wind and I was not cold. So <laughs> it was perfect. <laughs> awesome. That That's a really cool story. We got to, um, I got to chat with Maddie then next. Um, but, uh, really, really cool story. So I can't imagine what it must be like to have, like, I know what it's like. I've been married for 19 years to have a partner you're on board with, but in a lot of other ways, other than spearfishing, I cannot imagine to have someone where you have no children, like, but your equal passion is spearfishing. I think mm -hmm. that would just be, I mean, that would be insane. And I saw that you guys had done some other trips and down to uh, Baja and all of that. And you, you, uh, you, there was a, I think that one, I don't know if it was one trip or what, but you guys landed uh, some pretty decent, like both of you, I think hit some good depths on grouper and like landed some solid groupers. Yeah, we got, we got some nice ones last year. He got an 85 pounder and, I what well, mine was fifty two pounds. Yeah, I think yeah, it's fifty two pounds. Those are big fish. That was that was really rewarding for us too. He goes, he's been going to Baja quite a bit longer than I have, but I started to go too about once a year, and he goes about twice a year, or had been before he met me. Um, but yeah, we we love spearfishing together. Um, we work together in so many other ways too. And, and, you know, whenever I met him, I just thought to myself, man, this is the guy. And ever since we started dating, we're, we've been just truly inseparable in, in every way. So, um, definitely love having a spearfishing buddy all the time. I never have to go looking for one. That <laughs> he's always there. That's priceless. <clears throat> that's like half the battle. Like, you know, um, so the question is who's in charge when you guys are diving, do you follow, do you guys <laughs> take turns? Cause like, you know what I mean? Everybody has their own dynamic in a relationship yeah. and now you're in the water. Now it's like, wait, I got to just follow me for, let me lead for a chance. Like for a chance. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's got quite a bit more experience than I do, especially with driving the boat. So I'm, sitting here trying to play catch up and learning from him. And, and I've gotten to put him on fish too, like the big blue fin. And so um, definitely getting experience there as we go on. But um, in Baja and, and all the reef diving we do, we usually just hop off the boat and just say, see you later <laughs> and meet it up, meet up later and, and, and show each other our fish and, Sometimes, um, if it's deeper diving, we'll buddy dive for sure, do one up, one down. And if it's, you know, something that we're really focused on, or if it's a smaller reef and we're just focused on a drift dive to where, you know, we're drifting and we don't want to go over each other's spot and just it's teamwork the whole way. Um, he gives me information when he goes down and I give him information and, you know, it's, you know, Hey, check this spot out over here or dive here. Cause you know, the other night, um, we were halibut diving and I very embarrassingly missed a halibut in the sand. It was probably three feet away from me and lying down in the sand and I missed it. <laughs> it was, uh, I think it was a 12 pounder. So it was a big one too. And, uh, I pop up and I'm, I yell at him, get over here right now. And, and somehow that fish was still lying there and he was able to, to spear it and secure the fish. And um, then we found out later, I actually did clip the fish on the side and apparently it just really wanted to die that day. But um, yeah, we're just always, it's always teamwork for us because, you know, if, if I get a big fish, then it's his turn and it, if he gets a big fish, then it's my turn. And, and it's always, it's always a little bit of a struggle with him and I, because we all, we kind of are competitive with each other. And, right. and so we, we have to share, definitely have to share the, the glory or, you know. So, so um, 
You're saying that you 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 missed the you swam right pa- right past the halibut. Uh, no, then, I straight up missed it. Like oh, I shot at it. it and I missed it. <laughs> it was just I I think what happened. I was the gun was just I had to pull like a pull it up to my chest so so tight because the visibility was probably five feet. And um, it was just angled in a weird way. And I, I was at the end of my breath hold. And again, yeah. very embarrassing, but no, we no, still sh- got it. <laughs> yeah, shit happens. Did you go out um, during the Grunion run? Is that when you were out? Uh, no, we just, we go when, um, when we can park the boat and the tide isn't ripping too hard to where we're yeah. pretty comfortable swimming around looking at the sand for a couple hours maybe yeah, we'll find one yeah i understand i think i think there's a similar spot we have in mind too um it's really good for halibut uh yeah yeah so um all that being said when when you were talking about uh when you jump in and you guys are like see you later i you know it's funny with that um because every depth is different for everybody. So I was curious for you because I know you guys are some pretty deep divers for California, especially. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. What is like, what is your comfortable level of diving solo? And like, what's your kind of ethos or what's your, your plan? Yeah. So if, if, if I had to, so say I had, I got to this dream reef, with all the fish on it. And, and so if it, if the reef is good, I will feel comfortable diving 60 feet for a minute and a half to two minutes all day long with a break period, um, the appropriate surface time right. for those dives. And I mean, I, I think we feel comfortable doing that just because we know our limits and we're very comfortable at the bottom hanging out if we need to. But like I said, it's only if we need to, if we get to the bottom and there's no fish or we just think the reef is dead, just hard pass, move on. Um, No sense in wasting your energy on that spot or that section that you're going through. And, um, always leaving um, room for if a, you did shoot a fish, say if you did shoot a grouper, you you got to fight back a little bit because a grouper is just going to go straight into a hole if you don't fight back. And, and you have to prevent that. You just got to get that fish a couple feet off the bottom. And grouper are real interesting. They just go belly up and say, I'm done if you just give them that little willpower after that. So there's always a cushion after that. We we've dove much longer than that, but, but we'll, if we do dive more aggressive than that, we are definitely sticking together for yeah. sure. Yeah. It's interesting too, because um, you never know. I think you mentioned it with as far as having a built in like kind of safety threshold. Like uh I really rarely push myself um when I'm diving, but like the line diving stuff and, and all that, it's like, okay, yeah, I feel fine doing that. But if it's good conditions, that's when it's you know, it's kinda cool to have a buddy like you're talking about who's your husband, be like, Hey, it's on there's fish here like and it's deeper side um conditions are good let's go for it because i've done some drops you know where it's you know 70 feet which is pretty deep for me to be honest with you um and uh and there was like 10 feet of is and it's like yeah "Yeah, it's probably ain't gonna work today dude like i gotta be honest like (laughs) especially if i think people forget about the whole okay what if yeah i shoot a hundred pound grouper or I shoot a 50 pound grouper at 70 feet, 10 feet of is like, are we collectively as a team here going to be able to handle this safely when right. the inevitable, the inevitable is going to happen where it's just going to turn to, you know, you're going to have to dig this thing out. Like it's going to be an issue, but I like what you said though. Also, it's a, 
if you can put some pressure on them, like you said, they're, they're, they're like tractors, but man, if you can get some pressure on them, they just go belly up regardless of the size sometimes, but they, you got to hold on to them and let them tow you a little bit and like really kind of put the brakes on them. That's right. Yeah. Is that your, your biggest grouper you said was 50? That is, that's my biggest. That was his biggest at the day on, on that day. So that was just so epic to be able to share that experience with him. Um, you know, it's, it's great to be able to shoot those big ones, but, um, you know, you just always plotting and scheming for the next time, but we just feel like next time we're not going to shoot one unless it's bigger, just because we want to preserve the, the reef a little bit. You don't want to go shooting everything you see. And so we have a lot of fish. We're blessed to have a lot of fish. And so now we don't have to shoot it. You know, it's, it's I, I'm glad that for me, I'm in a position to say, Hey, I don't need to, I don't need to shoot that fish because I have some at home and I can save it, let it grow and, you know, just go, go around and, and, and shoot, select what you want to shoot. You know, you, you, I don't want to say I'm, I'm only trophy hunting because there are definitely a time and place for rewarding fish that are smaller that you have to work really hard for. Um, I couldn't be more proud of a 23 inch halibut, honestly. Like I love finding halibut cause they're just so difficult to shoot or to find and shoot. Um, but yeah, I, I just definitely have been ingrained to select the fish and shoot only what you need and, you know, preserve the reef for the future for sure. Yeah. So have you been back to Baja since that trip? Cause I don't, I haven't seen you post much about it. Those yeah, schools. no, unfortunately not. Um, I tried to go last year at the end of the year in October or November, but the wind was not cooperative and I have actually been in school for physical therapy in Texas so for about 20 months. I just got back last month and I was only making short weekend trips every now and then to come see my husband and, and to go diving. So I hadn't been able to go, but hopefully we'll get in a trip this fall. And if not, we'll definitely go in the spring. Very cool. So, I mean, so we had, I don't know, I think before I started recording, you had talked about you were a pilot in the Navy still, uh, and then you switched over to physical therapy. Right. Um, So I graduated from the Naval Academy in 2011 and got selected to go to flight training. And um, so I did that route and flew the MH-60 Romeo, which is a helicopter in the Navy. And about the nine year mark, I decided that I had been fulfilled with my flying career and I just wanted something a little more, um, you know, I just wanted to help people and, and I was very interested in the subject and the Navy allowed me the opportunity to go to school and get trained up in physical therapy. I went to Army Baylor to uh, get a doctorate in physical therapy and currently I'm finishing it up and I am on my internship now and about one year from now, I'll be practicing as a licensed physical therapist in the Navy. So got 11 years in and the plan is to get to at least 20. So, um, I get to do that for the rest of my career. And I'm assuming, uh, Maddie knew what he was getting himself into when he married a military person. He did. And, um, I'm grateful because he is, he is flexible for me and definitely helps the dynamic for sure that everything with me is so rigid and I, I have, I get told where to live and, and what to do and, and my schedule is not set, but he is very flexible and he's, he will conform to my needs. 
So with your so, change, with your change in, uh, I don't want to say MOS, but your change in job, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, what or are you going to have to change your duty station as well now? Um, not currently. I mean, there is physical therapists anywhere the Navy has a station at. Um, luckily San Diego is pretty large and there's more than a couple of physical therapists in the Navy here. But again, the needs of the Navy usually prevail and sometimes there's just not a spot here. So definitely a potential to move elsewhere, but luckily it is the Navy. So <laughs> chances are we will be by the sea. <laughs> so, um, definitely prepared to accept that reality if it were to come. Um, obviously would love to stay in San Diego, but the reality is within the next nine years that I have left here, chances are we're going to have to move at least one time. So but what would be, that's go ahead. Okay. No, well, what that's would okay. be some, like you said, it's the Navy. There's a lot of good opportunities for spear fishermen <laughs> mm -hmm. and when, spear fish, whatever you want to call it. Right. Um, divers yeah. in the Navy, where would you consider going? Cause I like right now I'm like, Oh, that would go there. I'd go there. I'd go there if possible. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, there is a whole bunch of places in Virginia. I'm not really aware of the spear fishing there, but there's Pensacola, Jacksonville, um, up North there's Oak Harbor, Washington, which would be cold water diving, but they've got big halibut and, and salmon up there too. So maybe we ha might have to switch to fishing, but that's okay too. Um, there is Hawaii, always Hawaii and, um, you know, overseas there's Japan heard the spear fishing is pretty good over there. Yeah. It's um, terrible. No, it's no good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, it's, it's interesting because, uh, so many times the dynamic is opposite where you've got the husband who's in the military and like my wife was in the army too. Um, but uh -huh. it's funny cause here you are, you're the diver, you know, and, uh, he's got to follow you around. And I just, I mean, some like, is, is, does he work also like, other than chartering or is that his kind of primary thing? Yeah. He also works on scooters, um, like a gas powered Vespa style scooters. And it's, a it's a, you know, he personally owned business. And so he creates his own hours. He sets it up by appoint, appointment only. So in that regard, he's very flexible. Like he can do what he needs to do in a timely manner and get that done. So that's one thing that he does. And then the charter business, hopefully like we'll, we're getting more and more bookings as, um, as the years goes on because Max just added this, this boat last year. So he was able to accept more clients. So the more clients he gets, the more that are going to return the next year. And so we're just building up from there. Oh, very cool. It's nice to be flexible. That's why I was asking to see how, if you yeah. did have to move, you know, um, how that would work out. So where are you from originally? I'm from Houston area in Texas. Okay. Yeah. And then you went to the Naval Academy and then, uh, was flying something that was always on your radar. <laughs> see what I did there? Yeah. <laughs> Not since I was little, but yeah. When I was in high school, I had strong desire to fly and I was really obsessed with it. And I just saw the United States Naval Academy had the most graduates go on to be a pilot. So I said, sign me up. So that was the, that was the plan to try to get into one of the service academies or just particularly the, the Annapolis. Uh, particularly Annapolis. I thought it was just a better fit for me. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. No, that's awesome. And then, so you, you've kind of, would you have anything on the horizon as far as like a big adventure, more records you're looking at or just goals, personal goals that you want to try to knock off? Yeah. Um, personal goal is to just, 
honestly just love like get back to Baja and go enjoy that reef. We love going down there. It's honestly one of my favorite places in the world. Um, we definitely want to get get over to Indonesia and spear go spear fishing over there. Um, try out the dogfin or dog tooth tuna and um maybe a panama trip and these are just you know if we had all the time in the world maybe we could go there but unfortunately the navy still has its reins on me and getting the amount of time required to go to a place like that is is hard to find so i'm happy just going to baja all the time just you know hanging out here i i mean the Southern California fishery is one of the best fisheries you're ever going to find. It's there's nowhere in the world like what we have, where you have live bait, you have the bluefin tuna, you have all the islands off the coast, all the beautiful reefs. And we're just so lucky to have what we have. And, and, you know, going to where I've gone before it, it's, it's just super special for sure. So I, yeah, I couldn't agree here. with you more. Yeah. Yeah. But yep. my husband and I love hunting too. So we've got, um, mule deer in the, in the winter that we love to go hunt, um, go, go to Arizona for archery and definitely have aspirations to go get an elk one day and maybe a moose. So hopefully trying to plan trips to do that. If the Navy gives me enough time off. How does the Navy deal with, because I have some friends that have to deal with this, um, but I'm curious for you. Is it hard for you to get permission to cross into Mexico? It's is... not really hard. Mexico is is pretty easy, but uh, other countries would be quite a bit more difficult. Right. Yeah, because I know some guys that had to like plan it out and their CO had to approve it or whatever it is for them to cross into Mexico, depending on, you know, times and all of that. And then others, not to mention any names or anything, but others just like, yeah, we're good. Let's go. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. All right. So um, did you have any, first of all, the reef diving in Baja is my favorite thing on the planet. I couldn't agree with you more. It's yeah. just it's just different. It's, I don't know. It's just different. Um, and it, the water's green. It's not crystal blue, but there's islands. There's tons of opportunity. And I've said it before where it's like the population of Baja is like 4 million people. And you've got twice the coastline of California. And it, to me, it's just like right around the corner. You just don't know what's right around the corner. Like what? A, yeah. You don't know what's on that drop. You know, you just don't know all these right. things. It's very cool. Um, and it's so close, like really, yeah. um, it's a simple life just to go down, go down there and, and just dive yeah. and then you come back and you have some Mexican food and it's <laughs> bring them your fish and they'll, they'll cook the fish for you. And it's just, it's, it's the perfect experience. Yeah. Where, where's your favorite place to go? I mean, area, region, whatever, when you go down there, where do you guys like to go? Yeah, I've only ever gone to Bay of L.A. My husband has gone to Gonzaga and I think a couple more places, but um, so far I've only made it to Bay of L.A., but definitely want to explore a, lo a little bit farther south if if I get the chance. Right. Yeah, very cool. Um, yeah, and it's funny, too, because there's a whole other coastline on the other side yeah. of the peninsula. It's like, exactly. oh, man. It's just, yeah, you could spend a lifetime down there. Um, and every region has like, depending on how far you go, has like their prime, you know, fish species that, and then it's seasonal. And then I think the other thing is that what's really unique of parts of Baja is you'll dive and you start seeing, depending on where you go, the mixture of fish species where you'll get like, a calico bass, especially on the Pacific side, but like a calico bass next to like a puffer fish or something. Yeah. And it's like, mm -hmm. or a parrot fish. And you're like, Hey man, are you guys lost or what's going on? Um, or turtles swimming around everywhere in the background. And yes. Yeah. 
just beautiful. Um, so you mentioned Indonesia. Have you been there before or are you looking to get there? Yeah, actually I have been there one time. Um, I went to, well, more than once I, I went with the Navy a long time ago to Jakarta, but, um, diving, I, when I was in Australia, I had a chance to get a, a week off of time and I chose to go to a dive class. Um, it's called deep week. And that's where I learned how to really dive deep. Um, and all the safety that goes with it. And we were just line diving in Bali every day. And, and that was honestly also one of my favorite things in the world to be able to disconnect and, and go take that class and meet people from all, all around the world to come do the same thing. And it was beautiful diving 40 meters of visibility and, um, had a great time learning how to get to the depths and get, get real comfortable in the water. Well, what was some key takeaways from that, that you, like you said, you really learned how to dive deep. Was it equalization? Was it? Yeah, I figured out that I was not equalizing properly. And on, on day three, I was just stuck at 15 meters and they told me you got a frenzel. And so I just stayed up all night, watched, the YouTube video from Adam Stern, the, the Australian record holder. I watched it over and over and over again for a couple of hours. And then the next day I had a breakthrough and, and, uh, two days later I got down to 40 meters and I was like, wow, the frenzel is where it's at. And since then I haven't had a, any problems and, and was able to progress to that. And then besides getting down to the depth, it was all the safety that was involved in, and being able to really be in tune with your body as you're going down and just realizing that slower is better. Don't be in any rush to get to the, to the surface. Cause you know, you're just going to spend more energy and, and being confident on how long you can hold your breath for. They do static breath holds with you and you're just, you know, you think you're going to pass out, but you're not, you're just, you just have to have to be really in tune with, with your body. And, um, yeah, so had a great time there and, um, also the people there, they were just a hoot, you know, a bunch of Australians and people from everywhere. It was pretty cool. That's cool. Um, yeah. Aussies are always a good time. I can I, yeah. let, well, speaking of Aussies, let's talk about your six months down there. Um, yeah, I saw you shot um, some Kingfish and, uh, I shot one. It yeah. was my, my big goal at the end of the trip. Cause I think it, it was winter time there. And, didn't, I didn't know anything. So I just went to whatever reef. And, and a lot of the times I would just go grab a lobster or two and go home because I wanted dinner. And, uh, so like I said, I would try to go through all the species and, and just figure out which ones I liked, but all my coworkers would say, you got to get a kingy, which is a yellowtail. And I'm just like, where are they? I just couldn't find them. I would go to every beach and, and it, w it was straight up a mission, especially towards the last month when I knew it was getting towards the summertime again and more likely to see them. Cause I was pretty far south The the water was a, probably about, it got to a low of like 51 degrees Fahrenheit. So it was pretty chilly the whole time. And finally it was warm enough and I knew if I was going to shoot one, it was going to be within the last month. And I found this spot where I had to hike down a very, very steep cliff where I, it's literally like you, you walk down the cliff and then at the base of the cliff, you get off into the water and it's just a straight down 
to, I'm not quite sure how deep it was because at the time I, I wasn't diving there by myself. So I, I, I would guess it to be 80 feet at least because the vis was always good. And I just swam up and down that rock probably two or three weekends in a row. And finally I found one and I shot at a yellowtail there. And the first one that I shot, I ripped off because my gun wasn't powerful enough and it didn't go through the fish. So I had to go back again. It was, that was at, at sunset the the weekend before I left, it was on Saturday at a sunset the weekend before I left. And then I was like, gosh, I have to come back here. And so the next morning at 4 a.m., I get up. I didn't sleep at all. I was like, I'm getting this stupid fish before I leave. And and I went to, got in the water right, right at the crack of dawn. And I swam up and down that ledge and finally got, got an okay-sized kingfish. And it was quite a bit smaller than the first one I saw, but I I was glad because at least it, my spear gun, the spear went through the fish that time and I was able to keep it. So that was probably my most proud spear fishing moment to date. So that's, that's pretty cool. It seems like it always comes together because I had a similar story where it's the last weekend, last shot, and it all comes together and it's like storybook, you know? Um, and I like what you said because it, that has nothing to do with size. It's just like, good Lord, everything that went into it to make it happen and check the box. Yeah, that that's great. So you before I previously mentioned hunting, have you always been a hunter? Like is that something like on land and then you kind of wanted to get into it on the water side of the things? Yeah, I've been hunting my whole life, honestly. My – um my dad and my grandpa uh, grew me up hunting. They they had a little chunk of land, um, only like 20 acres that was in the country in Texas, and they would go out for white-tailed deer. They had a couple stands on it. And I remember I was probably five years old when my grandpa first started taking me into the stand with him to hunt for white-tailed deer and I would go every single year with my grandpa or my dad into the stand and um I think I I took a shot at my first one and when I was about 11 and um I've gotten a couple there over the years and luckily in Texas while I was in school, I had the opportunity to be stationed next to an army base that had 33,000 acres of land that I could go hunt. You had to have a get lucky and get a deer tag, and I didn't look out this year, but we were able to go and just shoot as many hogs as we wanted to because they're out there, they're totally infested the lands and they're a big menace to everywhere in Texas. So, um, that was what I did while I was landlocked and couldn't go fishing, spear fishing. And we just, every weekend I was out there trying to stalk a pig with my bow, just hiking around all, all around those, the woods over there. So, um, yeah, I've been hunting my whole life, and when I discovered spear fishing, it was it was where the ocean met hunting. You know, swimming met, met hunting, and and I grew up swimming my whole life. That was my sport, and so it, it just it was pretty natural to me to to fall in love with it. So, so you swam at the academy as well in college? Yes, I did. Okay, yeah. How did you do? Pretty good. I did all right there. Um, it was, it was really tough. It's, it's a really, really fast school. Um, it, yeah. I ended up, I, I swam up to sophomore year and then I, I started doing triathlons after that there and was, was pretty successful with, with triathlons too. Very so, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you had spent 
uh, doing triathlons and you'd spent a lot of time in the water and the ocean on the East coast too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, not, not so much in the ocean, but definitely during a race potential to get into the ocean and yeah, I mean, I just love the water. I would always, when my mom, my mom taught me how to swim when I was little and she would always tell me, Tracy, when I dunked your head under the water, when you were a little baby, two year old, and I brought you back up, you would just put your face right back in. She, Very cool. She was, she didn't want me to put my face back in. But yeah. Well, definitely um, a tribute my love for the water to her. Was, so would you say that you spent most of your time, you know, obviously swimming competitively, but swimming in pools, did you have much experience in the ocean before you kind of dove into spearfishing? I wouldn't say no. I, yeah. I mean, Texas, we were, we were quite a bit away from the beach. I liked going, but the reality was, is that we might go once a year and, um, no, not a, not a whole lot of experience until that first lobster dive. And, and that time I was completely hooked. I was like, I got to get out here again. I was out in La Jolla and saw the reef there and, and I wanted more. So what was there a bunch of like, was there some things that were, um, was there much of a learning curve with going from, and the reason why I'm asking, I have a friend that was a national champion swimmer um, mm -hmm. for like D something. I don't remember exactly in college. And then she did the La Jolla rough water swim. And she was like, dude, like I thought I was going to drown. Like just the <laughs> difference of dealing with, I think part of it was just there's so many people and they're climbing over you and all of that. But she said just the ocean in general, she, grew up in the mountains and swam and then jumping in the ocean. And I've heard this from several people that transition from, you know, understanding a pool and being comfortable in the water is one thing. And then going and dealing with currents and waves and, you know, no visibility and all this other stuff is something else. Did you yeah. struggle or, or have to deal with some of that stuff as well? And like, how did you overcome it? Or did you notice anything like that? You know, I, I honestly, I don't think I can relate because when I, when I first dove, I was just so in love with it that, I mean, I particularly remember I, I was very, very cold. I was not in a correct wetsuit at the time. It was probably a one mil and there was a lot of things wrong with that first dive, but I walked away thinking, I got to get back here. I got to get back here because it was just, it, you know, spearfishing for me, it, it's, it's more than, you know, just seeing the reef. It's, it seems like when you go spearfishing, it, it's the only thing that you can think about. Like it, it, it requires so much concentration. You have to hold your breath. You have to keep yourself alive first and then you have to look around you and you, and you have to and then you have to hunt and so it, it's something that that takes your mind away from anything that is happening in the world and and it's something that you have to put all of your focus and effort into and and i just feel like that's the reason why i like it so much is because we're so busy all the time. You never get a chance to really meditate and just, you know, be where you are. And this is just a way to, to force yourself to just be there. And there's nothing like it there. I can't think of a single thing that requires so much of your mind and, and, you know, your presence to be able to do. Well said. Yeah, that was great. And I think, uh, I, 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 I think part because of that, I think that's why you enjoy diving on reefs so much because there's so much to focus on, right. Compared to bluefin where you're jumping in blue water. It's like, is it, it's like yeah. present absent. Is it there? Or is it not? I know when you're hunting yeah. on a reef, it's like, and then there's a part of, part of me too. Where I think about it's, uh, 
if you take it too seriously, you spook everything for whatever reason, you're putting out this vibe where it's like you're hunting compared mm-hmm. to like letting go and then, but still having to do all those things that you just mentioned. And then, right. yeah, pretend like you don't care, but you really care. <laughs> and then like, <laughs> it's such a weird cat and mouse thing that, uh, I, I, I agree with you hundred percent. It's just, it requires, I think the biggest thing is the audio, just everything turns off. You can't hear anything. It doesn't matter. You've lost that sense. And then right. now you've got to turn everything else into hyper and then you've got to do all this other stuff. So very cool. Very cool. Um, yeah. yeah. So other than, um, let's say you talked about going to Indonesia, all that stuff was, and, and I find it very interesting and I and thank you for being honest where you're talking about the transition from freshwater is like, I didn't really care because I was just in awe the whole time. I mean, that's pretty, and that's all you can think about. I think that's really cool. Have you ever been like in a situation diving where you're like, um, in some big sea state or something like that, or you're like, well, that was close. That was gnarly or, um, anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, sea state, I, I have gotten a little too aggressive at times, but nothing that I didn't feel like I could, could not recover from. Um, but there was one time, um, I was, I shot a Bonito at the Coronado Islands and it was just a calm day, no big deal. And it was actually two Bonito at one time. I, you know, they swim in very tightly packed school. So I I happened to shoot two at once and, um, I had my spear gun and, um, it had a reel on it and a sea lion came to take the fish away. Pretty standard. (laughs) And, uh, the sea lion was taking the fish and I was kind of like trying to hold my gun and, um, and, and then the sea lion dropped it. So I, I just, okay. I'm like, okay, just bit off the head of one fish so I can get the other one. So I just started pulling in my line and then the sea lion came back and grabbed it again. And, um, the line kind of got tangled a little bit and it started dragging me around and I could, barely even breathe. And, um, and so, uh, yeah, it was, it was pulling me everywhere and, and I couldn't get the line untangled and then it dropped it again. I'm like, okay, cool. All right. Crisis averted. And then no, no, that not averted. It came back. And, um, the whole time I was thinking these things have to rip off. It has to rip off my spear because they, they were, pulling me around in the water very quickly. And, and then it came back and I was also trying to catch my breath and then grabbed it again and started pulling me full speed underwater. And, um, I got really scared. And after about 10 seconds or so, I let go. And I just wanted to say, like, get clear of the line, like make sure I'm free and clear of, of the real gun and, and, um, I, I was just really scared cause I hadn't, um, I hadn't been able to breathe back up after the dive. And so it, it all happened so quick to me. I, I just wasn't catching my breath and, and I didn't last very long when it, it pulled me under. And so I just had to, had to let my gun go. And it was a beautiful Captain Bly spear gun. And I was very sad, but, um, that happened and I was just glad to be okay. And, you know, in hindsight, probably could have tried to get my dive knife out and cut the line, but I just, I couldn't even barely hold on with one hand. So I, I just had to let it go. Yeah. It's, uh, that's, that's scary. Just hearing about it. Cause that's a re that's a reality every time you go out something like that. But I mean, those are scenarios you almost want to run through in your mind and train to, to be like, what if, right? One of those what if things. But, um, I mean, 
yeah, you made the right decision, right? Rather than that and drown. I mean, yeah. You know. Um, that's crazy. I was thinking it was like a pipe gun. I didn't know it was a Captain Bly, like really nice. Yeah. Gun. <laughs> it was my first nice gun. And was it positive? Was... was it, was it floating? Was like, no, no, it, it, it because it, it had the shaft still attached to it. Uh, the gun will sink with the shaft still attached to it. Yeah. So it was, oh. it's summer. Somewhere in the ocean. Where were you diving in the Coronados off Pookie Point or Pukey Point or uh like... It was the South Island. Yeah. South I was just South curious Island. if anybody ever found the Captain Nice Captain Bly spear gun. Oh man. Oh that's terrible. Yeah. yeah. I think if you spearfish long enough, you were gonna find yourself in a situation like that, whether it's a shark, whether it's a big fish, whether it's a sea lion and it's nice to be able to, like you said, I mean, even cut people realize like trying to cut something when you have water pressing against you, like mm -hmm. it is different. It's not that you can just like grab something and sit up and cut it. Like I almost drowned in like three feet of water some one time because my leash was stuck on a rock and I was like, oh, so this is how this happens. Like I can't yeah. physically lean up to reach it because the current is so strong and i'm just basically getting dragged behind you know not dragged with the water it's like being dragged behind a boat or something it feels like yeah um, well first of all thank you for taking time out of your day and meeting with me on a short notice and i think i was surprised when you're like yeah I'll be, I, we can do it at this time i thought you'd be out diving or something um oh that was yesterday yeah so. see, okay <laughs> fair enough yeah um but uh, if people want to get a hold of you or want to uh, speak with Maddie about Mad Max Charters or whatever it is about maybe linking up or can you give us your social media in info or? Yeah, it's um, mine is just Tracy Wintmeyer, um, no spaces, just not fancy at all. And then um, Maddie's is Captain C-A-P-T-M-A-T-Y, Captain Maddie. And we're both on Instagram, um, also on Facebook. None of us, we don't restrict our profiles. So definitely can scope us out on social media pretty easy. So Very cool, very cool. And um, congratulations again on that fish. Um, well done. Thank you. I know you guys go out all the time and... Um, it was well deserved, I th in my humble opinion. Not that I know, but that was well deserved. Uh, very, very cool. Thank you. Yeah.